All right, welcome to episode 43 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. His name is Derek McAllister. He's a philosophy PhD candidate at Baylor University. He specializes in history of philosophy, history of and philosophy of psychiatry, depression, human flourishing, virtue ethics, medical ethics. In addition, his curiosity spills over into areas like philosophy of religion, philosophy of emotion, epistemology, and existentialism. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Hey, Glad Derek. To be here. Thank you so much for coming on, man. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. And so the first thing that we want to start off with is obviously since Derek is a kind of um, so he studies or he's a professor of kind of psychiatry and the history of psychiatry is that we want to ask you about depression and about depression's history. So can you tell us a little bit about the concept of depression and depressive disorders and how they've evolved over the years? Yeah, of course. Um, well, you know. Uh, uh, you know, as you may know, our, our history of psychiatry, you know, is, is really relatively new as mm-hmm. far as history goes. So uh, I think as far as far as in my research, the word depression didn't really come into common usage until maybe about like 1908 with Ryle. That's R-E-I-L. Um, and then and then it didn't really gain traction, I guess, until maybe about. Uh, I don't know about, uh, let's see, 1908 with Adolf Meyer. And then we do have some usage of the word depression, like in 1816 or so uh, in some, in some uh, languages. But yeah, I mean, so, so really we're dealing with like the concept of it. Um, When you think about the concept, the conceptual development, well, that becomes hairy too, because uh, you know, you've got, professional organizations um, like the RCP, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and then the APA. Uh, so the RCP didn't even come into being until like 1841, APA in about 1844. So that's when you really start to see things being coming, well, not at that time, but you see the, the seeds of things starting to become codified and standardized. Um, before then, uh, the 1840s, you really, um, it's just sort of a Wild West sort of, you know, uh, uh, understanding of, well, you, you have the melancholy, uh, mm-hmm. concept of melancholy and the four humors paradigm. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was that? So, yeah, so the, um, this is, this is an ancient uh, sort of paradigm, the four humors, you know, melancholy, uh, which is, uh, more or less a conceptual predecessor to depression. Mm-hmm. Um, it it comes from the word melon and colere, which is literally just black and bile. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's just black bile. And it's just you had excess of black bile in you. Um, so it's this really sort of elementary understanding of um, what was going on as far as uh, et- etiologically and then biologically, physiologically. Um, you just had this excess of something. And whatever it was, it was black bile. Now, there were other humors, uh, you know, four of them. Um, but this would be the one that made for it depressive. And sometimes it was understood as, like, uh, medical, mm-hmm. you know, sort of medical abnormality, uh, pathological. Kind of- or it was just understood as like the personalities, you know. So you may just be a melancholic personality. Yeah. Would, but, that, would that kind of be like a chemical imbalance today, the imbalance of the four humors? Ooh, uh, it's a very early sort of. It's a very early sort of um, conception. Right? Yeah, conception of it. Yeah, that precedes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they were as sort of reductionistic as as we tend to be today. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, insofar as they they were being like biologically reductionistic about it, yeah, that that would pretty much yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, um, did they know? what caused depression at that time or because it was so early in the conception of of these definitions that they were just working off of for example the four humors paradigm and kind of an uh, older styles of conceptualizing depression like maybe they didn't necessarily for example today we would say maybe there's a chemical imbalance Maybe there's uh, inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's actually just your your thought processes and uh, maybe feedback or uh, or feedback loops that usually we may get into. Um, back then, they probably had a different conception of how to, you know, uh, 
explain depression or how it's formed yeah. probably i imagine yeah um <clears throat> So, I mean, they certainly only have like the, the worked out mechanistic sort of same things that we are, 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 are trafficking in today. However, you know, the basic stuff was still there. Mm -hmm. um, they understood it to be really multifactorial uh, as far as the way it was caused, um, uh, not simply one's own biology or genetics, for lack of a better term, whatever term they would use at the time. Um, but yeah, it could take on sort of a social, uh, uh, uh understanding of cause, um, or that cause might be spiritual. Uh, it might be relational between people, or it might be systemic, you know, systemic, uh, uh, poverty or tribulations or what have you. Yeah. So that was, I mean, they had a good understanding of this, um, even though they weren't using the same sort of language that we were using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how did they define melancholia? What did that mean? Wow. Uh, <laughs> great question because they find it in a whole lot of different ways. Um, so around like the – just before the 1800s, uh, going back to like 1700s or so, um, you have this really real proliferation mm -hmm. of uh, what are called nosologies, mm -hmm. which – Nosologies are just uh, like a taxonomy or classification of, of uh, illnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, mental illnesses or diseases. <coughs> so, but you, you, there's no. It was really wild west. It was like every man for himself. And um, and you had one commentator around around early 1800s, David Hozak, who who actually uh, says enough is enough. You know, he's like you know. Um, you know, you guys are just trying to be clever. You're just, you know, thinking of distinctions just to think of distinctions. And so, I mean, melancholy meant everything from uh, sadness, like we understand it today. Uh, but it could mean something like paranoia. It could mean something like uh, even um, homesickness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, just real radical understanding. So, so just, just trying to stretch the meanings uh, as far as possible. And many times these people... Uh, may not have been actually in uh, clinical settings and have patients of their own. They were just sort of just, you know, uh, like biologists were at the time, mm -hmm. after the Enlightenment, just thinking of ways to carve up the world, divide up diseases, and they were coming up with really creative ways to do that. So so eventually we settled upon this sort of, uh, I guess, went back to this sort of traditional understanding of melancholy being sort of like a sorrowful affect. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, traditionally, melancholy, uh, melancholy itself has like two traditional uh, affects. One is the sorrowful one, and one is like an anger mm -hmm. one. Uh, uh, th that, that tracks well with um, what is it? Sort of like a uh, I forget. Uh, what are what are the symptoms of depression? Where oh. it may be either a sorrow affect, or it might be like a Yeah, like a, a sorrow. Um, oh, do you mean like in terms of major depressive disorder? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the thing is for in terms of the DSM diagnosis, you need to either have um, a persistent state of sadness and or, or rather, it's one. It's usually one or the other. It's a persistent state of sadness or an inability to feel pleasure in things that you once found to be pleasurable. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, the, the one I was looking for was the irritability, isn't yeah. that? Oh. Okay, that's a, a, a interesting component that sort of just is there, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, but we we have that in uh, the traditional understanding of melancholy. So you'd have like anger or uh, melancholy, and then you'd have like a sorrowful melancholy. And that yeah. that's just sort of yeah, that's hey. the background. <laughs> And it's, kind of, and it's kind of so interesting the way we define it because um, just I think even the way we define anything medically or at least psychologically medically speaking because there's so much overlap between these different diagnoses. And um, so I think in, from my kind of vague understanding in the DSM that it's pretty much it says something like you have to have either a persistent like a uh, state of sadness mm -hmm. or you need to have like an inability to experience pleasure. But the thing is it's you, it, could, it might be wrong. It could be both, right? But my thinking is that a lot of times it actually is both. And it's very hard to even separate depression from anxiety. Anxiety. I mean, it's even been argued that depression and anxiety are the same thing. I don't necessarily agree with that, but the idea yeah. is that they're actually comorbid most of the time. So it's yeah. really interesting how we kind of try to classify um, these various illnesses when most of the time they actually go hand in hand with sort of a plethora of other illnesses that in some ways kind of overlap. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, but these distinctions are important, mm -hmm. right? Because, for instance, uh, say I were depressed, mm -hmm. right? Or as the experiencer of depression or the experiencer of anxiety. Right. Uh, understanding the distinctions between how you would feel in either state. Uh -huh. I mean, even though the you they can overlap, right? If, um, for instance, maybe I'm depressed. Maybe it's like a sorrowful sort of depression right. but for instance i wouldn't necessarily have anxiety performing some sort of a task right. or engaging with people or something like that no or, was, oh go ahead actually. Well, i was gonna say so i'm sorry i should have been clear what i meant by overlap so by overlap i mean that like there are different clusters of disorders where they actually have very similar <coughs> symptoms to each other mm. so it's very difficult distinction to distinguish whether it's this thing or the other thing so i mean like and i obviously get it in terms of like classifying it's really hard to do that right um, because it's pretty much classifications are man-made. I mean, it's something that we kind of have to figure out on our own. But sort of the trick is to figure out, like, when is it this or when is it that? Like, you know what's interesting? Like, for kids, a lot of times, depression and ADHD actually look like the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very hard to distinguish. And sometimes it can actually be both. So the way we kind of classify, it's it, the system of classification, my kind of thinking is, is just not as easy as kind of people think it should be, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think mental illness as a whole, it's very kind of difficult to distinguish sometimes, like literally what's going on with the person or what's what. Derek, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's all I mean, I mean, we, we have this understanding of like, um, uh, you know, the DSM will carve up things in a certain way. Uh, you know, it's, so yeah, we have the problem of depression and anxiety being comorbid, like for example. So, uh, but we classify depression as like a mood disorder and anxiety we classify as an anxiety disorder. Right. Um, you know, but these things are often, you know, they, they often manifest, uh, uh together or, or, or they're really difficult to distinguish in, in reality. Uh, and those kind of problem are just, those accompany virtually every disorder that that you will come in contact with. Um, you know, maybe like so bipolar and schizophrenia, for example, very very difficult to distinguish. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. How so? Uh, I'm not familiar with it, but just in my in my experience with uh, uh, shadowing a clinical psychologist over the summer, I uh, uh, just. It was one of the examples that he would use, you know, that's a very difficult thing, you know, it's hard and often they'll get misdiagnosed. Uh, and then I think it's his diagnosis, he says <clears throat> something like um, uh, for a bipolar or something like eight years or something for like a real effective sort of diagnosis where you uh, checking off all the boxes and seeing someone for this long. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine because, um, like, let's say if you're in a manic episode, what happens sometimes is it bleeds into psychosis. So I can imagine if a person comes in with a psychotic, or in a psychotic state, that for the most part, this, they would, like, automatically be diagnosed with schizophrenia rather than bipolar disorder. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's why a lot of times in the field, I mean, well, not a lot of times, all the time, we have what are called tentative diagnoses, because, like, a lot of times you're actually just wrong. I'm actually yeah. curious, um, how did we, you, you know, discounting yeah. modern treatments, or mm -hmm. we'll, I guess we'll get to that, but yeah. I was wondering, how did we used to treat depression or melancholy? Oh, that's interesting, Derek. What, what did your research say? <laughs> um, well, you know, interestingly, a lot of the same way we do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll give you some examples. So, for example, uh, you know, I was reading some... Um, 18th century, 17th century, what are called divines or ministers, you know, of the gospel, like Puritans and Anglicans, uh, people like um, uh, uh, whether Robert Burton, who wrote the uh, Anatomy of Melancholy, or uh, Bishop Jeremy Taylor, or Richard Baxter, or someone. Uh, yeah, so uh, just reading these guys, and they all will say, you know, here's here's the issue. They'll just assume that you know what melancholy is, or or that you. Uh, and if you don't, they'll give you some kind of, they don't go off some DSM because there is no DSM, right? right. Um, but they then they give their advice or their directions, you know, for, for, uh, uh, directions for proceeding or whatever. And, um, and a lot of times these will mimic, you know, they'll, they'll just mimic what we do nowadays, you know? So it may be, uh, something like, you know, surround yourself with friends, you know, uh, or, you know, if if the uh, melancholic thoughts are too severe or too penetrating, then uh, make sure that when you do say, you know, when you are in prayer, that you are in prayer, that you are not in prayer for too long, you know, 
you know, so <laughs> give yourself a break, you know, go easy on yourself. Uh, make sure you examine your thoughts, um, huh. things like this. So yeah, so, so really interestingly, um, and then, and then the same, in the same vein, however, these, uh, these same authors will say, don't neglect physic or medicine. Right. They'll say, you know, listen to your physician, you know, and obey him, do what he says. Um, but at the same time, there are these, uh, I guess what we call behavioral things or, or cognitive things that we can, uh, these activities we can engage in uh, as well. So yeah, really, really similar to what we would do nowadays. Of course, there were some other things there too, uh, like uh, uh, some things that we may not put have like in a uh, sort of a uh, sort of like a, a cognitive. Well, we may we may have in a um, uh, we may not have in in modern day clinical settings. Uh, due to like ethics issues or whatever, so uh, you know we're, he'd he'd recommend because he was a pastoral type figure, he'd say you know pray or you know engage in that or that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a little difference there, but yeah, for the most part, really really similar to what we do these days. That's so interesting. Yeah, I see now what you mean by it was the wild west of, of uh, back then, especially yeah. like they were experimenting with different ways of treating patients mm-hmm. and. Um, a lot of things that we do now mimic what they did back then, mm-hmm. but these people were pioneers in their own right of you know figuring out different methodologies of how to maybe approach patients you know depending on the context of that particular patient situation. Right. And so you know, I was thinking, Derek. What I guess, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so you know, like kind of now we have what's called the biopsychosocial model. And yeah. so right. So though, just kind of for our listeners, the biopsychosocial model pretty much says yeah. that when we come to or when it comes to any sort of like let's say medical or mental psychological ailment right the idea is that the model says that there's sort of three factors that contribute to it so we have kind of the social right which is your environment right kind of your upbringing um whether or not you have a strong support network etc um you also have a kind of the genetics right you're obviously your predisposition for various ailments Mm -hmm. and then the psychological is pretty much your your set of core beliefs and you know you're kind of how sensitive you are how you interpret the world around you um so how is it that i wonder in your kind of understanding derek of psychiatry and its history how do we kind of get from a point that or i guess yeah it was from a point from what you said that like we were pretty much interpreting in that way in some way because there's sort of these different kind of um let's say whatever cures for lack of a better term Mm -hmm. there were these different ways of reducing suffering whereas kind of now as we move forward in psychiatry it's mostly like it's a medical model it's not biopsychosocial we pretty much just reduce it to the biochemistry that the person experiences right or whatever not experiences but the biochem the pretty much the biochemistry that the person has so how is it that we went from a more nuanced understanding of mental illness to this one that just says here you know pretty much take this pill and you're supposed to feel better because it's only this um yeah that's a that's a long and complicated story to tell uh first of all though um um i mean there there are so many moving parts so one uh i'll say just there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of political issues here, right? So like um, the politics of um, making sure that things are secularized and not necessarily uh, identified with one religion over another. Uh, and if we can secularize it, um, you know, you know, we can get it out of the field of religion. We can get it into the field of science. Um, but even beyond that, you know, you're still dealing with sort of, you know, you still have the biopsychosocial, you know. But now people are talking about like a biopsychosocio spiritual hmm. model. That's interesting. Uh, that, uh, but but they're trying to incorporate this in a real sort of um, even keeled uh, um, sort of secular way without without being, uh, as I say, you know, too preferential to one religion over the other. So they're just using sort of broad, vague principles. Um, and then defining spirituality is like real, you know, broad in broad terms. So, um, uh, I don't know if that's very, uh, effective. Um, but anyway, back to your thing. So still having the biopsychosocial, however, why would there be so much, you know, emphasis on the biomedical, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I hate to simplify it, but, um, it's easy. It's quick. You know, um, you can, you can pinpoint it's quantitative, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you can get, you can identify it with insurance. You can get insurance to cover it. 
Um, you know, so, um, you know, most, most people in mental health absolutely will concede that depression and many of these other disorders are multivariable. And there's many things that go into it. It's not just the biomedical. It's not just the biochemistry. Um, so, but the way that you get, you know, so this goes back into like uh, politics of funding and stuff, you know, uh, you know, people want to fund projects that are like, you know, real sciency and stuff. So right. they'll want to fund the pharmacology of this. Uh, and you've got, uh, you know, not to sound too conspiratorial, but, you know, this is, uh, so this, this is a big problem. And then once you get in the actual clinic, um, you know, people just want to, f- people just want an answer. They just want to get it fixed now. Right. Um, and, um, I mean, that's, that's a cultural, that's a social thing that we've sort of, we have now. <laughs> so, yeah. um, what's the fastest way to do that? Well, just a biochemical sort of understanding of depression. If we just say it's a chemical imbalance, um, and we can fix it with medication, then great, you know, um, and then another thing is um, if we uh, – another thing uh, as to why emphasize the biochemistry is because it takes the, uh, it takes the responsibility off. So it, uh, it no longer is something that you know, I did or something or that uh, – you know, it's something that happened to me. I can be really passive about it. I can just be sort of an observer. So it's, it's some condition I have. Um, Rather than something that you know, uh, I go to therapy for and I work through and I'm actively engaged in, uh, you know, <laughs> actually working through. Um, yeah, so it takes the responsibility off. Yeah. And from my kind of, um, I guess, experience, I, I mean, obviously, Derek, I also want to hear from you if you've ever seen anything like this. What I find is that for the most part, because psychiatry is structured the way it is, and I mean, I'm not really sure why, but I guess, I mean, whatever, just just that's how things are. So the way kind of psychiatry is structured is I'm sure you know that people kind of come in in 10-minute blocks, right? So you pretty much go in to see the mm-hmm. psychiatrist. The psychiatrist is like, hey, have you been? It's like, yeah, I'm feeling better. Okay, good. Maybe we decrease your dose. I'm obviously feeling worse. And okay, maybe we increase it, right? So kind of what I find a lot of times is that the way the business model of psychiatry is structured is that it actually doesn't make sense to go into a deep understanding of why a person is sad so what they do a lot of times is they say well go see my therapist for that so what happens is that it's sort of and for the ones who don't do that I mean the idea for them a lot of times is it just makes more sense financially to just frame it that way because this way they could just say okay I mean you're feeling worse then it's a simple solution right you don't need to be here for more than 10 minutes <laughs> so pretty much I could kind of so I could kind of just give you medication right and sort of send you on your way I don't know how much I like that. Why? 10 minute blocks. Oh, you didn't know that? I didn't know that. That's oh, the wow. first time I heard that. No way. I, didn't yeah, know. Yeah. I know that they refer yeah, you yeah. to the therapist for a more in-depth like uh, session. Right. I didn't know it's 10 minute oh, blocks. Oh, yeah, man. You... And it's once a month. <laughs> we just blew here's, it apart. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I, it's, so I get it. it. But in a way, it's almost like you're playing like, uh, what's, it called? what's that game called? Uh telephone or yes. potato I right, right, right. absolutely yeah, yeah. there 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 are levels of there are things that are kind of blocking you actually knowing what may be going on with right. the patient right that's rough yeah. Yeah, and so and from a, so it's so interesting because um so I have like a nurse practitioner that I refer people to. I don't want to mention her name because maybe she wouldn't be comfortable, but she's pretty much the best clinician or one of the best clinicians I've ever encountered. So she is a prescriber, right? So she's not technically a therapist, mm-hmm. but the thing is, um, kind of some of the heat that she received when we worked together was like because she would see clients for about thirty minutes at a time, and so the person who she was working for was like, well, "What are you doing? You can't do that. You can't see people that long. We we need you to kind of cycle them in or in and out quicker." And so she was like, yeah, but like, I'm not really like getting a full picture of what their issues are. And the person who was her boss was like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You're supposed to give them medication. They're telling you, I feel this way and you adjust accordingly. That's it. That's literally your job. And of course she didn't like that. So she ended up leaving. But the thing is, it seems like kind of from the business perspective, which obviously makes sense that it doesn't make sense to really get the kind of, you know, deep down to the core of what's going on with the person, because at the end of the day, all you're really doing is prescribing anyway. You're not their therapist. So it's kind of interesting in terms of psychiatry, why or how how we kind of split off, right? How is it that, because a long time ago, psychiatrists were also therapists. It was like, if you went to see an analyst, that analyst had an MD, like Sigmund Freud was a doctor. He was a physiologist before. Um, And then so... My question to you, Derek, is how did that happen? Do you know? Like, how did that split happen? How did psychiatrists just become prescribers and then therapy sort of veered off into its own Mm -hmm. field? 
I'm not sure. Yeah, um, that might actually, be tough. Uh, yeah, no, you'd have to look at the sort of, yeah, the psychopharmacology, the development of that. There's some really good resources out there. There's a David, uh, I think it's David Healy, who does a lot of interviews with psychopharmacologists. Uh, and early generations of people starting from like the 1920s or so uh, and um, uh, who were born around that era and then saw the whole development. Um, that would maybe be a good resource because he has like three volumes of interviews. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, Thomas A. Ban, uh, B -A -N, he's also a really good resource for like the history of uh, psychiatry, the recent history as well. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head how that actually happened because right. it seems like the american way in some way like they pretty much just made it a completely for-profit business right mm. and again i'm not obviously there are wonderful psychiatrists out there but i'm just my thinking is that this is becoming some way like the new norm where people just sort of cycle in and out and if you really want to talk to somebody there's this other branch that you have to deal with right yeah so you know uh, th this is something i was just talking about earlier today is that you know it's unfortunate i mean yeah uh, any sort of medical profession is a lucrative sort of profession and you know any profession like that's going to have its uh it's tempting you know things to corruption and but the thing about this is just systemically it doesn't you don't have to be very corrupt if you just follow the rules yeah. and do what are what what is designed to be in place like uh you know so for example um i i've been seeing the same doctor he uh for about four or five years now and he's he specializes in family medicine. That's what he uh, was in residence for, and he's now like in his 60s or something. So he's done this his whole life. And the benefit of that is he gets to see people, uh, not only people, but see them grow up. He gets to see people uh, and their families. You know, he'll he'll so so you get this really great perspective of getting to see. You know, so so if I go to him and I say, you know, I'm not feeling well, you know. It's not as if, you know, he has to guess, you do all this guesswork, you know, to figure out what's wrong. He knows, you know, just because of the relationship I have with my wife or what's going on in my life with the stresses or what season it is, you know, what period of the semester it's in or something like that. Uh, so he has the context, you know. Um, but the unfortunate thing is now just the way that medicine is set up, this is rare, you know. We, we're very, you know, so... When I um, <clears throat> when I shadowed the clinical psychologist I did over the summer, uh, I was in a sort of consultation clinic, so it's sort of like a more speedy process, and 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 you know it was it was uh, it was for the benefit of uh, uh, lower income families and impoverished and so on. So it was uh, so you had what like one person for like ten thousand or more, you know potential patients. So, uh, you're very stretched thin now. Uh, so he'd have people come in and he may see them for 10 minutes, like you say, uh, just to assess them. Um, and they'd come in with maybe a history, um, or, or maybe no history. They'd, they'd come in, uh, and, and there's a danger there in assuming that, uh, whatever it is on their chart, he said, you know, this is one of the biggest dangers, and he would tell his, uh, his uh, residents this, that uh, there's a danger in assuming that whatever's on their chart, whoever saw them last, um, spent a lot of time with them, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's a dangerous assumption because that's yeah. rarely ever the case. Yeah. Uh, so, so if it says something like uh, bipolar on their chart, you know, it may be that the last, you know, psychiatrist they, they saw was – you know, they only saw for 10 minutes or something, you know, and they only saw once ever, yeah. you know, and they got this diagnosis and now you inherited them. Um, and, and so, yeah, just systemically the way that medicine is set up, the way that mental health care is set up, it's not an, a, it's not a, it's, it, it's not in a best ideal way to work. Yeah. Um, so that's how I mentioned the, the family medicine, you know, uh, uh, this is a better model you know, for, for what, you know, given the options that we have, you know, because you're able to see somebody, um, you know, where, uh, for lengthier uh, and build relationships and so on. But, yeah, I, 
it's just not it's not good systemically you know you, you guys want to hear a wild story sure oh um, so okay when i was uh so when i was practicing in the clinic and i was part of a team so it was actually with this nurse practitioner that i mentioned before so there was a client that we saw who was actually passed on to us by the head psychiatrist of the clinic so um and she was i guess if i had to guess maybe in her mid-30s right um so she came in initially so i really i was really like put off by her right she was really like angry and irritable and aggressive and then my thinking was like oh god like here we go right it's going to be another one of those sessions so as we're going through the intake session right um so this is something kind of like um these are like questionnaires that the team kind of picked up on as a whole it wasn't just me um so as kind of like she did these different intakes so well it wasn't really an intake so i mean it wasn't it wasn't because the psychiatrist had already been seeing her but then he kind of passed her off like to me to see the therapist and then he passed her off like to the np and then so we did kind of our own separate questionnaires and so what we actually discovered was that like um so she was actually experiencing hallucinations that nobody for whatever reason caught over the years right and then so um so pretty much the team decided that it was best for her to take another medication which was completely different than what she was taking like it, but it was an addition so come to find out like let's say three weeks later she was virtually a completely different person because literally we caught this and if we had the person who was her treating physician did not had no idea when we told him he was like oh huh, that's interesting I, I never knew and so and she's been in like therapy and like psych with psychiatry for ages and so the thing was that was actually making her irritated was that these voices wouldn't shut the hell up so her thinking was like yeah wouldn't you be angry she's like they're like literally outside voices in my head telling me that i'm awful i'm terrible i'm dumb i'm whatever and obviously after like you know pretty much the kind of team got the medication for her what happened was that she actually became a much nicer person so wow. but crazy stuff like you would just think that some like a psychiatrist somewhere down the line would pick up on this and she was like i can't even believe this she's like and when i at when we asked her pretty much about the voices the way she kind of conceptualized it was that it was normal. She's like, oh, well, like nobody ever asked me about it. So I just assumed everybody has them. I'm like, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's wow. how interesting psychiatry can be, man. And that's kind of like in 10 minute blocks, how you can easily miss important information. Oh, yeah. 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 And then so I guess kind of going back to what uh, Derek, you were mentioning before in terms of like how religion and spirituality was used. So uh, kind of obviously as Alan read on your um, on your bio, you're also interested in sort of existential therapy, right? Or existential psychology, uh, philosophy. Um, so that and then also obviously kind of coupled that in with your understanding of how religion was used. My kind of question is going to be, how is it that kind of over... I don't know, I guess over the span of like, you know, centuries that sort of, um, I guess that depression has been sort of known or conceptualized. How is it that people have used religion, spirituality and philosophy to treat it or at least to reduce the suffering? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, so, so in order to understand the, like the history of how we treat things, whether with, uh, you know, in order to understand like the history of religion versus medicine you know you really have to understand like the history of philosophy you have to understand the history of thought um you have to understand like why why is it that sort of religious thinking fell out of fashion you know in the early 20th century uh so you've got to go back to like nietzsche you've got to go back you know prior to that you know uh and so um yeah so i mean th there are there are big moving forces here uh uh but Basically, I can say this. So, uh, so to answer your question, the what did people use? Well, nowadays people, of course, are trying to reincorporate this back into treatment. They're trying to use. Um, uh, they usually term it in uh, in terms of like RS, religious slash spiritual uh, interventions, what have you. Um, and like I said, they're doing it in a, so, so in order to be an empirical science, you know, that's verifiable and so on, um, uh, and psychology, you know, it doesn't take into account, you know, whether there's a God or whether there's anybody on the other end of the, the telephone, you know, it's just, it only takes into account like the, the subject, the, the individual, the patient, and then what they're experiencing. So, um, so with these religious spiritual interventions, we can, you know, you know, use them to sort of see how a person feels like if they pray a little bit more, you know, um, and so, you know, so, so though we have that, um, or, or where do they experience gratitude in life and gratitude to whom, you know, or it may just be this sort of generic gratitude or something, um, or whether they experience forgiveness or something like that. 
Um, a few problems with that, you, you only have half the equation here, you know, because you're trying to be an empirical sort of in science. Um, so you, you only have like half of a picture then. Um, yeah, and then, so, so there have been attempts to do it, but it's been more of like a, more from trying to do it from like a neutral or secular perspective to reincorporate spirituality, you know, like spiritual, not religious, you know, um, to where it's sort of kosher for everybody, you know, everybody is okay with it, you know, we can incorporate, we, you know, we can talk about gratitude, because nobody, nobody hates that, you know, you know, everybody can get on board with gratitude. But, you know, if you start talking about, you know, gratitude to God, oh, well, you know, <laughs> gratitude to which God, you know, and so, um, so it, ha it stays in a, in a, in a, in a realm of the generic. Um, and so you, so with that, there are so many limitations, you can only get so far. Um, it is something, you know, um, but, but again, like, I mean, and usually sometimes those, those issues might come up in, uh, like uh, clinical treatment. I don't know, you know, then maybe the clinician could be more open, uh, uh, or not, you know, uh, to those, to those subtleties. But, um, yeah, but like, uh, so, so, yeah, I'd like to hear you guys thought. What do you think? Well, about actually, I wanted to ask, uh, what kind of spiritual uh, values or, or what, what, what sort of spirituality are they incorporating now that's more secular into therapies? Like beyond uh, gratitude. Is it like stuff like meditation, for example, uh, I imagine? Yeah, yeah. So we've got, um, let's see. So we've got, um, well, of course, the mindfulness, the recent mindfulness stuff, the meditation, um, you know, things like, um, um, let's see, expressing forgiveness to others, you know, and what feelings that has to oneself. And then uh, it, it, sometimes even calculating church attendance, you know, and what, what effect that has on depressive symptoms. Um, feeling forgiven by God, cultivating outlook, gratitude, and so on. Yeah, so, um, and a lot of times, you know, in, in studies like these, uh, the, these will often correlate inversely with depressive symptoms. So the more people do these, the lower, you know, the, the lower the depressive symptoms they'll feel. Um, yeah, but again, it, it, it ends up being like a really generic sort of thing. You can't really sort of... Um, get a full picture of, of this, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, do you want to say something? No, so, so pretty much it's kind of, it's not something that's so easy, like there's only so far you can go, there's not a, um, you can't necessarily make it for a mass, <sighs> or, or this is, or rather I should say, this is more catered towards any individual as opposed to a particular individual who may have a different sort of, um, if if they were going to go down a spiritual route, maybe there's another level of depth that they can approach that might be better for that particular person as opposed to how general they are doing it currently, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so by generic, I mean like um, they. I mean they're not taking any preference with respect to what religion. So right. so they'll define spirituality in th things like. Uh, you know, meaningful connection to, you know, meaning making, you know, but, it, but again, it's always with reference, uh, necessarily with reference to the subject, the, the patient. So it'll be like meaningful connection to something transcendent or something. Um, well, what is transcendent? Well, we don't know, you know, it's just, you know? <laughs> so it's just existential. Well, you know, whatever gives somebody hope or meaning or something, but we can't really define those things just for what the person themselves, um, you know, thinks. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very generic and, and because of those limitations, because of limitations in, in how we're defining these things, you, you can't really get into, uh, yeah, you can't get beyond, you know, uh, so, so meaningful connection to the transcendent, you know, um, so, so for example, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, I, I heard of this study, I can't think of the name of it right now or what year it was, but it was a recent one within the past 10 years where they did, uh, it was in Canada and they flashed, uh, sort of, 
uh, what, uh, sub, subconscious uh, uh, prompts, and they, they would flash like either God is smiling or God is frowning, mm-hmm. right? Uh, during whatever other activity it was that the participants were doing. Um, and and the, the investigators of the, of the study, they, they thought this was quite meaningful. They thought that, you know, the, if people felt, you know, guilty versus, uh, you know, when they saw the God is frowning, that was pretty significant. Uh, and when they saw God is smiling, you know, and they felt happier, they thought that was significant. Um, but nobody took into account, like, who God was, like, what, what religious context this was, you know, for like a Lutheran, you know, God's always frowning, you know, <laughs> Catholic, God's always frowning, you know, uh, or, you know, so, so nobody like sort of went deeper into understanding, um, you know, the, the religious context of the, the participants beliefs, you know, they didn't define God. They just, and they did it in a, in a sort of subconscious way in any case. And, and so you have this, this study where participants are uh, assuming just a generic understanding of God and, and, and whatever attendant beliefs, you know, they, they had going into that study and just not examining it, you know, like I, I assume they'd go into the study, um, Thinking that okay, if if a if a person sees that God's frowning, then that means they're they they're guilty, and if, if a person sees that God's smiling, that means that they must be pretty pleased. God must be pleased with them. But that person may not just ha- may not have those beliefs at all, you know. Hmm. So I'm talking about that. Yeah, you got to say really generic because of the separate worldviews that you're you're studying. Um, you know, I, I I'd like to see more worldview based studies you know where you're like okay we'll just take a population of just christians similar theology and we'll um so that when when we say god we're we're meaning this you know and so we get much better uh you know results that way much more meaningful results than what we're getting now that's so interesting. interesting. And I mean, it kind of seems like the whole endeavor of religion and philosophy, I think, is just, it's been obviously throughout the centuries, just literally a, a kind of ways to sort of quell man's disquiet mind. I mean, it seems like we've created these, uh, I guess, I mean, even I would, it's so hard to even sort of divide the two religion and philosophy, because again, overlap, right? There's so much overlap between the two. But I think that both were created in ways, right, to sort of help us, first of all, feel better about ourselves. I mean, obviously, unless you're Catholic, because I mean, that's like linked to severe low self-esteem. And uh, but like uh, for the most part right it's sort of these um, kind of endeavors were ways for us to sort of feel safe in the world right to kind of feel good about ourselves and to feel safe in the world to be able to make certain predictions and I mean obviously if you believe in an afterlife another sort of sense of safety if not in this world and somehow in the next and so the way we kind of view religion and philosophy it seems like is that before psychotherapy was a thing that these were sort of the original forms of therapy what do you think Derek yeah yeah absolutely um you know, there was space for, like, the medical, like, as I said, you know, you had these people in the 18th, 17th century saying, listen to your physician, uh, take medicine whenever it's prescribed, uh, because we want to treat the biological side of this. But um, but along with that, I mean, you might, you might think, you, you might even say that uh, the pastor was in the position of the, the counselor, the therapist, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he was the person, whether it be the pastor or the priest, who you would be seeing on a weekly basis anyway. Right. And they like that family physician, you know, in family medicine, somebody who you'd see on a regular basis. They know you, they know your family, they know your contacts. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, that, that role was often taken up by uh, the religious leader. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and then how have Thomas Aquinas and Kierkegaard influenced your thinking? Cause I think we read that on your bio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, really, really heavily. And, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, so in, in, in a couple of different ways. So uh, uh, Kierkegaard or Kierkegaard is as the Danish, uh, pronounced it. Oh, I'll just say Kierkegaard or, or uh, yeah. <laughs> either is fine. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, is, let me start with Thomas Aquinas. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, he was a, was called a eudaimonist, uh, and a virtue theorist. And, um, he believed that we had a uh, natural telos or end to, uh, you know, just as a knife is used, what, what is it for? Well, it's to cut, 
You know, well, what are people for? Okay, you know, well, it depends on their function. What's their special function? So he gets this from Aristotle, and human beings' special function is uh, to reason, and to reason well, and, to, uh, and we're social creatures. So, uh, so all that to say that our natural end is going to be human flourishing. It's eudaimonia. Uh, in other words, you know, people tr- translate this, and unfortunately, to happiness. Uh, there is happiness involved, sure, but it's like an objective sort of happiness, human flourishing. It's like not. It's it's like the difference when you know. So if you see a friend in a bad relationship, uh, and you're trying to tell them, uh, look, you know, and I know you'd be happier, you know, <laughs> if you weren't in this relationship. Uh, they think subjectively that they are happy, you know, and they try to fool themselves and so on. But but you know, and they know once they get out that objectively they would be better, much better, you know, more flourishing outside of. So that idea of uh, so Aquinas, he takes this from Aristotle, this idea of a natural telos, eudaimonia. Um, but Aquinas also includes our ultimate telos, because uh, after this life, we have our, we, we have a natural telos, which is eudaimonia, human flourishing, or happiness. And once we cultivate all the virtues to their fullest extent, you know, that will lead to a life of flourishing. Um, but then after this life, uh, we have our ultimate telos, because... You know, you can die and cultivate all the virtues, great, and you'd be happy, but, you know, what then? You know, so, so after this life, uh, our ultimate telos is beatitudo. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, this is the beatific vision. Uh, uh, in the Orthodox tradition, this is uh, theosis. This is sort of, sort of like a becoming like God, becoming Christ-like. Uh, so the beatific vision is just a uh, uh, vision of God or being in God's presence, just being... Uh, in the unmitigated, uh, unmediated, just direct presence of God. And so that's, that's the ultimate telos uh, for all human beings. Uh, so I take that uh, as a guide, and that, that's super-duper important. So I think, that, I think this is important for, for example, um, you know, I haven't worked this out very carefully quite yet. Uh, this is one of the pro- projects I'm working on, but... I, I think this is critical for uh, maybe even treating depression. If you're going to do it like in a Christian worldview perspective, especially, um, you know, we talk about meaning making. We talk about, you know, uh, whether it be, you know, given a, an old lady uh, friends in a quilting club, you know, to, to make sure that she has something that she's doing, you know, so that she's not home, so you're not home depressed. Um, this would be... Not, not of course, on that small scale, but it would be something that gives uh, a person meaning, and this would be like an ultimate meaning sort of goal here. So I think that that's been largely influential to me, um, and I think a lot of the virtues that uh, Thomas would recommend uh, for us cultivating in order to be a good person, um, the virtues, I mean, moral or intellectual, they shouldn't be thought of as like, oh, you know, uh, you know hoity toity, you know, greater than thou. Uh, if you have them, you're, 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 you're good. If you don't, you're a bad person. Uh, these virtues are meant to be thought of as like excellences, like just as like a knife is, it's, a, it's excellences to cut. That's what makes it a good knife. What makes a human, a good human is its excellences and to excel in this way. So like being the best you, you can be, I guess we, we'd say. And so, um, and so cultivating a lot of these virtues would also be uh, really, really helpful for uh, uh, treating and depression. Things like things you wouldn't even think about. So like, I mean, things you might think about. So like perseverance and patience, of course, fortitude, um, but also things like uh, you wouldn't think about necessarily memory hmm. and foresight. These are the intellectual virtues, some of the intellectual virtues. So memory, just to understand like, okay, well, what symptoms was I experiencing back when I started taking my medication. That's hugely important because your care, your treatment with your doctor, whoever your physician is, is going to be based on largely self-report. Right. <laughs> so, so it's important that you remember. It's important that you're self-aware. Um, so just things like that and foresight, knowing that, okay, you know, I've, I know I have a stressful month coming up. You know, so I need to I need a brace for it or something, you know, just have, having awareness like that and prudence. Uh, yeah. So those uh, 
just just uh, yeah. So those are some examples of the virtues that Thomas uh, uh, would 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 uh, say would contribute to leading the good life. And yeah, I mean that, that those have been extremely helpful. Right, and that sounds so interesting because, like, um, for a lot of times, what what happens with, um, like, let's say if a client were to go see a therapist or even psych- or a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner, they would pretty much tell them to jot down their thoughts. So a lot of times, um, well, the way the kind of CBT cognitive thought record, or I'm sorry, cognitive thought model is structured, is that we have these automatic thoughts that sometimes we're not aware of, and they in some way contribute to our symptoms. So. Um, the way we kind of, um, I guess the way we deal with our clients in that respect is sometimes that they don't really know what they're thinking. Or sometimes they think, well, I'm just depressed. I don't really know why. So what we do is we kind of ask them to track their thoughts to obviously kind of see what's precipitating the symptoms of depression or whatever it is, anxiety, you name it. Whenever it's sort of excessive, when it's not like just like, you know, regular sadness or just your average kind of fear or kind of worry or, you know, nervousness. So um, when it's sort of more persistent and obviously more intense. Mm -hmm. And so what's so cool about kind of Aristotle's and Thomas Aquinas' model is that it pretty much tells you that in some way it's also your responsibility. That unlike the medical model, which pretty much says like, no, no, just go see the doctor and the doctor will take care of it. You know, kind of philosophy and psychotherapy will say, um, actually, we can't do that for you. So it's like we can't cure you, or we can't heal you, but we can help. Sort of as a, as Irv Yalom once said, we can be your fellow traveler and kind of help you along on the way. But here's the thing, though: the vast majority of the work is going to have to be done by you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a synergy that goes on between the patient and and the and the doctor and the therapist, right? right? And uh, it's not just the doctor's responsibility to just come up with a methods or or ways to heal them. Right. It's it's their responsibility as well. And what's interesting about the cognitive thought record, it actually goes along with uh, Thomas Aquinas's um, aspect of of memory. Right, because you're you're going over what it is that uh, may have led you here, uh, or how did you feel at this point, or when did you start uh, feeling this way, right. and uh, how do you feel now, and also have you tried anything to, um, you know, to remedy your situation? Right. How did that help you? Yeah. Oh, it actually helped you. Okay. Well, why aren't you doing that right now, or why were you doing that before and then you stopped? And that's just an example. Right. It could be. Yeah. many things right and what's so dope about like just you know kind of philosophy and psychotherapy so um derek i don't know if you've ever listened to like joe rogan's podcast so mm. oh so well the way he kind of frames it and i i really love this idea and i mean uh, i guess i don't really know how it's interpreted for the most part these days but i think it's like it's kind of it's a bit more rugged and a bit kind of like tough lovey which i don't know does it seems to be kind of falling out of favor in a lot of places i almost know what you're gonna say I, but let's okay <laughs> so the way he kind of frames it is that like look he says well he pretty much way he talks about this with predominantly like younger boys but i think this is obviously also true for girls where he's like look man boys need challenges and he's like for them if they don't have those challenges what happens is they don't build up what's called self-efficacy which is pretty much the confidence in yourself to overcome challenges and self-esteem and feeling good about yourself and overcoming those challenges so the way rogan phrases it is like we kind of take that away from people and well for we especially take that away from kids when we kind of you know try to shelter them when we try to sort of shelter them from obviously you know kind of bad words or people saying harmful things to them um we shelter them even sometimes from fighting right which obviously in the bigger picture is not a good thing but i also get where he's coming from because he's like well we shelter them from having to defend themselves right and so he's like for like boys these are all experiences that are necessary for growth and so what happens with the medical model is pretty much the patient or the client is passive. And so they're kind of coming to the doctor who's in some sense like kind of a guru or wizard type. And they're like, help me sort of feel better. And they come to the doctor and the doctor's like, here, yes, I have all of the, I have like this grand plan for you, right? And as long as you stick to my script, you'll be okay. And so the person kind of is dependent on psychiatry, right? Which is why a lot of times people actually don't come off of medications. They just sort of just, because how can you? What's, how do you, I mean, because once you come off of it, you're back to where you were before. And so what the, what's so cool about psychotherapy and philosophy is that it's pretty much like parenting or like kind of a more traditional form of parenting where the person on the other end is saying like, hey, I can't do these things for you. I'll be there to support you and I'll definitely be there to give you a helping hand. But any good therapist will tell you that the point of therapy is actually not to need it anymore. We want you to get to a point where someday you don't call us anymore. You're sort of, you go off on your own and you use these tools right after sort of perfecting them through treatment and perfecting them to practice on your own. And then eventually Eventually, you kind of go off on your own and these tools are just tools that you have by obviously in this case cultivating through memory right and so what's so cool about psychotherapy and 
and philosophy is that it's not a way to remain dependent on a particular person or a particular thing, right? The point is for you to sort of grow, like kind of we all have to. And sort of, um, and I don't want to just ramble on, but the last thing is that with philosophy, it kind of gives you these truths that might not be obviously so good to hear or so maybe tolerable for some people or maybe even for all of us. But the idea is it's sort of an acceptance or helping you to get to the point where you can accept reality and also, as importantly, accept responsibility for your own mental health. Mm -hmm. Dark, what do you think? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, I want to respect as much as possible the um, the subjective state of mind. Like, you know, um, it sucks. You know, harm sucks, and you know, uh, it hurts when you get your feelings hurt. It hurts when you when you are told that you're doing something wrong, yeah. uh, when you're a piece of crap. You know, or you're even speaking these things to yourself. Um, but you need to balance that out with these these what call them whatever you want these coping mechanisms these practices these behaviors um that you know enable you to actually participate in your own care i mean so there was this one meta study i, I was trying to look for it but i couldn't find it the name of it uh oh yeah it's uh, jenkins and goldner in 2012 uh uh approaches to understanding and addressing treatment resistant depression a scoping review so they do this meta review uh and and they they note that you know the vast majority of the paradigms that people are operating in, even though we understand that depression is multivariable, is it's going to be from a biological point of view. However, uh, it has its costs and benefits. You know, so its benefits are that you know it takes the pressure off. You can get medication for that. We can fix you. <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't your fault. You know that you're like this. Um, Maybe you were born like it. Maybe, it, you know, it happened to you or something. Uh, the costs, however, most people don't talk about this. Um, the costs are that um, it's out of your hands. You know, you, you suddenly become maybe even despondent or in despair because you can't change. You know, it's just your brain chemistry and you are like this. So, so the way they say it is they say, um, you know, it, it, the biological model, yeah, it has all these successes and so on, but but it it doesn't give people like a, a, that feeling of agential control over their own treatment. You know? mm -hmm. And so I think you need to balance those things out. It can't just be uh, one or the other. You know, the, you got to come from both sides of the game. Yeah, and I just kind of want to be clear, just kind of for our audience, we are definitely not against psychiatry and medication. Absolutely. So psychiatry yeah. and medication are wonderful things. And sometimes, mm -hmm. look, for some people, the medication is enough and they could kind of just go and live there. And that's absolutely okay. But what mm -hmm. we are saying is just a lot of times that agency is absolutely right. necessary for a lot of people in treatment, that the medication in itself is not enough. That's it. And if there, if there is any critique, maybe not to have 10-minute sessions. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if there had to be some sort of critique, otherwise it is a necessary thing. There are pros and cons, but right. I'm not going to say psychiatrists are bad. Right. Um, yeah, but we, we we're forced to say we're forced to emphasize the bad, the the criticism of it. I mean, this is something I, I take from Kierkegaard as well, as well, because um, uh, he would. It's a rhetorical move. You would emphasize. You'd say things in the strongest way possible. Mm -hmm just to emphasize the criticism, uh, even though uh, the real like letter of what you're saying may not be in fact true, it's the spirit of it, you know, you're just coming out and railing really hard against, uh, against things and say, showing it how it's the worst and so on. Uh, try to get people to, uh, if you can get people to sort of, uh, uh, you know, back away from that side and back into the middle, then great, you know, you've done your job, you know, but um, so this rhetorical move. So, so, yeah, so, we're, so the, the fact that we're criticizing this doesn't mean that, um, you know, that people shouldn't do medicine or shouldn't try that. I think that's, a, that's extremely important. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that we're pointing out these other, uh, other things that we should be doing, yeah, that's just, I mean, do them together. You know? yeah. And I really love that because it's like, um, yeah, so that actually makes so much sense and sort of, um, and the way I even speak because so now I'm kind of thinking about it and there are a lot of times when I kind of exaggerate criticisms or at least hyper focus on them as not so much as just to discount the field or a particular thing altogether, but just to get a person to actually think about like maybe the downside of whatever it is that I'm talking about. Yeah. Huh. And yeah. so Derek, what else have you taken away from Kierkegaard? 
Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, anytime I read Kierkegaard, I, I've come blown away. Uh, he has a, uh, a very unique way of approaching things. You know, he's, uh, he is sometimes called the father of existentialism, mm -hmm. but he's different from many existentialists in that he's a Christian existentialist. Uh, I mean, he gets criticized a lot for being uh, fideist or, you know, faithist, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being anti-rationalist. Uh, but I think that criticism is unfair. I think, you know, the, the criticism about, oh, he just takes a leap of faith into Christianity because it's benefits or whatnot. I think that's really unfair. The, the fact of the matter is that uh, Kierkegaard was a... a veritable genius probably the greatest thinker uh christian thinker since thomas aquinas um the man wrote volumes and volumes and, as well as his journals and so on uh and his insights are just so fascinating and penetrating um it's hard to read sometimes because he just goes on <laughs> he just you know yeah like, I, I found him to be really you know? difficult yeah yeah and that, that that was that's my impression often after reading him you know Again and again and again, I'm just like enough, you know. <laughs> I got it the first time, you know. Uh, but if you stick with them, if you have a good guide, you know, I, I, uh, my dissertation advisor is uh, Dr. C. Stephen Evans, and he's he approaches Kierkegaard not in a uh, from a continental view, but from an analytic perspective. Mm -hmm. So for those people who are of of that mind, you know, like I am myself, um, that's really really helpful, um, and. Uh, yeah, I'd recommend having a good guide so that you know kind of what to look for in Kierkegaard, know where the nuggets are, know where the good things are, and then uh, and then how to read it. Because you got to know how to read the guy. Right. <laughs> it's easy to just just throw your hands up and be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, you know. And I've, I've done that before, yeah. <laughs> I threw my hands up and I was like, I don't understand what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> Truth I, is, I, I read him back in college. I remember it was a uh, existentialism, uh, basic writings of existentialism, some kind of book with a bunch of different little excerpts in there. Uh, so since it's an ex excerpt, obviously I'm not relating to you guys. You obviously read probably yeah. some longer text. Not not me of Kierkegaard. Oh no, definitely there. I I remember liking him. I just uh, I feel bad. I can't reference anything at the moment, but I remember liking Kierkegaard. Yeah, yeah. as far as that goes. Uh -huh. yeah. I hear you. Yeah. So, I mean, did, did Kierkegaard ever offer any remedies for sort of, um, I guess, anguish or sort of depressive syndromes of any sort? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, maybe not necessarily remedies, like, uh, for the symptoms, you know, because it's not, it's not something he was concerned about. But mm -hmm. big picture stuff, you know, as a philosopher, as a worldview thinker, oh, excuse me, um, you know, he, he had uh, deep penetrating insights as to... Uh, what that was like because he himself suffered from depression and his father suffered from depression. So, uh, so, you know, if you're, if you come from like attachment theory perspective, you understand like, you know, how that may have formed him in his life. And, and he later, uh, went on to be like, not a hermit, but somebody who just wrote a lot, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so, so you have this unique perspective, and he's not offering remedies per se for like the uh, specific symptoms or whatnot, but he is offering these big picture, uh, you know, so, uh, cause he doesn't think that depression itself, uh, he doesn't look at it as like, okay, this is a problem to, it's a, it's, it's a medical problem, which we need to solve and then we'll be fine. He, he's worried more about the human person and the human condition and what, human problem <laughs> there is and that problem is sin and how do we solve that problem you know uh and so depression may be uh uh or, or melancholy or you know as, as he says tongue sin together or heavy mindedness uh uh kids some leg head which is like a uh boredom you know uh but it's like a really deep existential boredom um those things are symptoms of just our fallenness you know being uh, separated, you know, uh, from our creator. And in fact, despair, the, in, both in the German and in the Danish, we don't preserve this in the English, but despair, uh, the, oh yeah, for, for twivelous in the twi, twi, TVI is actually the word two in Danish. And it means it's like a split apartness and a split apartness, not only from oneself, but from God. And that's why we're in despair. And so that, that's his diagnosis of the situation. And of course, the remedy for that would be a diagnosis to come back, 
you know, and, and to reunite and define one's meaning there, much in the same way that, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas with his ultimate telos. It's not just to live life and be happy and, you know, or to make whatever it is, success, what you have, you know, whatever you would decide for yourself, maybe existentialism would have, but it would be, you know, um, the end goal would be, you know, mm-hmm. unity with God. Yeah. Interesting. And so, Derek, one of our final questions is going to be, I mean, based on your own research of psychiatry, where it's been, where it's going, do you think that there's ever going to come a point where it will be sort of so, so nuanced and kind of so precise where mm-hmm. we'll be able to say, okay, these are sort of um, the particular forms of depression that are better treated with therapy, and these are the forms of depression that are, let's say, better treated with medication, and maybe these other ones are better treated with a combination of the two. Do you think we're anywhere near that? Um, it's a good question. Uh you know, I I don't know. Uh, I I'm not. Uh, if I if I were to sort of hazard a response, I would be uh, I would be one in the camp of being more cautious as to what like precision medicine can offer. As far as far as precision medicine now, if, if we're talking about like a, a, a whole you know quiver of uh, sort of uh, resources or, or, or techniques to use, you know, I think I think that's that's perfect. You know, let's, let's use a variety of different techniques and methods to, uh, cause it may be that, you know, what works for one person, obviously we know this already, what works for one person is not going to work for another person. So, um, but I don't know if we'll get to the way of like, be able to predicting, uh, be able to predict exactly, you know, based on whatever your genome is or whatever your family is. I mean, right. how am I going to get that information anyway? You know, I only have 10 minutes with you or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the point of actually being, when you walk in the door, I know exactly what you want already. I mean, yeah. if, if it's going to be individualized and tailored to specific persons, it's going to come through the human relationship there, you know? And that's that's a systemic issue with psychiatry. That's why that's what needs to change more than anything. Not, not you know, what better, you know, precise medicine can we have, you know? Wow, that's, I think, a brilliant way to end the show. So, Alan, final questions before we go, man? Um, yeah, if we wanted to follow your work, uh, h- how could we? Yeah, so uh, my website, uh, Derek-McAllister.com. Uh, mm-hmm. You can find me on there. You can find me on academia.edu. I have a page up there with a few papers. Uh, and Google Analytics, Google Scholar, I think you can find me on there. So, yeah, yeah. and yeah, but mostly my web my webpage, Derek-McAllister.com. Cool. And th- thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, this was so such much. an insightful and fun show. Awesome. Glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Thank Most you. Def- for- Most def- and I hope you obviously have a safe trip. Man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, man. Thanks again. Take care. Good. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, right. Super was- interesting show. Super, yeah. super interesting, man. <laughs> well, guys, uh, I'll tell you this. If you want to follow us, uh, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. <laughs> <laughs> and then also find us at the O4L Online Network under the show section. We are under Seize the Moment Podcast. That's right. And see you guys next week for episode 44.